The April meeting of the Ottawa chapter of the Canadian Aviation Historical Society. Tonight's speaker is Bill March. Bill has had an interesting and varied career. He spent almost 42 years in the Canadian Forces and RCF as both a navigator on maritime patrol aircraft and a staff officer in Canada, Europe, and Afghanistan. Bill was most fortunate in that during his time in uniform, he spent a total of 10 years as the Air Force historian. A graduate of the Royal Military College and the University of Victoria, he has taught undergraduate courses in history for RMC and written or edited numerous articles and publications on aerospace power history. Bill volunteers with the National Air, Air Force Museum in, of Canada in different capacities, most recently as a member of the Museum Foundation. He is on the editorial board for the Canadian Aviation Historical Society Journal and is a contributing editor for Air Force Magazine. While working as a freelance historian and writer, he is pursuing his PhD in history at Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario. He has the honor of having as his wife, the former Joan Verner of Ottawa, and is extremely proud of his two daughters, Erica and Brittany, and his four grandchildren, Emma, Eileen, Grayson, and Nixon. Please join me in welcoming Bill March. And in case you didn't know, we're gonna talk about the RCF and the Aleutian Island campaign. And yes, uh, it'll be a, a whirlwind tour, if you will. First of all, Kyle mentioned how you guys are going through Tim Hortons and donut withdrawal. So this was the best I could do. I'm sipping a Timmy's. I hope some of you are, except for Matt, who's, uh, who's imbibing early today, but that's fine. So the Aleutian campaign. So you have an idea of just how far away from the, uh, the halls of power in Ottawa, the Aleutian Islands actually are when, uh, when you're looking at an RCF and RSF campaign. Okay, so here's the front matter I stole from the official history, which gives you an idea as well too. So the little circles are airfields, the little triangles are seaplane bases, and the squares are naval bases. So you can see that during the Second World War, at least after the attack in Pearl Harbor, the West Coast is a hive of activity both for the Canadians and for the Americans as well. So again, when I'm talking to young people, young officers or young uh, aviators, and I talk about the Pacific War, they seem to have certain concepts about how Canada participated in Pacific War. The very first one, if they have any army background, they think of Hong Kong and our uh, disastrous introduction with the Royal Rifles and the Winnipeg Grenadiers. Then if you've got a Navy background, you tend to think of the mutiny on HMCS Uganda in 1945. And if you've got an air background at all, you tend to think of Hampton Gray or Leonard Burchill. That's really where you summer, where you focus when you're when you're looking at Canada's participation in the Pacific War. And if you've got a little bit more of an in-depth knowledge, especially on the air side, you think uh, four through six Scottish Dakotas. You think uh, the guys in Southeast Asia Command and the uh, the uh, handful of people we had on radar sets. But there's not a lot of in-depth knowledge. And if you have nothing to do with Her Majesty's military in any way, shape or form, this is what you think about when you think about Canada's participation in the Pacific War. So for when I brought up the Aleutian campaign, it was like I was planting seeds in a desert because they all looked at me like never heard of it. But to understand the RCF participation in the Pacific War, you really have to start with the defense of North America and one of my all-time favorite prime ministers, William Lyon Mackenzie King, the madman of Ottawa, who I started off hating as a died in the world conservative and came around over years of studying uh, wartime policy of Canada and everything to think that, like him or hate him, he was a pretty sharp operator when it came to Canadian politics in Canada in the Second World War. In this case, one of the things that he did was he ponied up or cozied up to the United States with respect to wartime production and with respect to defense. And one of the brainchilds that came out of what he was doing was the Permanent Joint Board of Defense, which uh, basically uh, operated from about 1940. Now this was a binational organization that basically looked at how Canada and the United States were going to defend uh, North America 
in the event of either a attack by European and or Asiatic powers. So with respect to the West Coast, what they were really looking at it, they were really looking at uh, the possibility of, of Japan. But from a Canadian perspective and what Mackenzie McKen King was looking at, he didn't think he was going to have to do anything on the Pacific Coast. He was pretty sure the Americans would be able to, uh, to deal with anything that uh, might arise in the Pacific. So from his perspective, when after the 7th of December, 1941, the two things that they really started to looking at was they were looking at how they were going to A, support uh, the war in Europe via the, uh, the Northwest staging route and, and filing or funneling aircraft and supplies over to Russia. And the second thing is how they were going to deal with defending Alaska. So basically the Northwest staging route is funding aircraft up through a series of airfields that they're gonna carve out of uh, virtually nothing and take you over to Nome and then over to the Soviet Union. And then with, the, with respect to the different airfields and things you're gonna see, you're gonna see a lot of these airfields uh, created virtually overnight and they're still gonna be used uh, today in, in many of these Northern fields and stuff like this. Uh, indeed, some of the uh, some of the hangars I think date back to 1941-42, and it's going to be the funneling of aircraft. Uh, everybody loves the virtual pictures of the Air Cobra. Uh, they look good with a Russian star on them for whatever reason. And that lovely picture down on your lower right—that's what uh, Fort Nelson looks like in the middle of a of a, of a winter. And then the other one is the Alaska Highway. The Alaska Highway, again, is going to be uh, built virtually overnight using construction troops. Tens of thousands of Americans are gonna come north to start to build this thing. And this probably more so than anything else is going to cause the politicians in Ottawa great angst as they saw this as a virtual American invasion. But these are really the two big things that from an Ottawa perspective are gonna be taking place during the opening months of the Pacific War. So when it came to the actual uh, opening of that, that front, the attack in Pearl Harbor, obviously, and then Canada declares war on the 8th of December, the following, the following day. In fact, uh, I think we declared war before the United States did, which I find rather interesting. Now, the West Coast in, on the 8th of December, 1941, is a virtual backwater when it comes to the RCF and Canadian defense. There is no doubt that from the perspective of defense, the RCF is at the forefront. There's not much in the presence of the Canadian Army. The Canadian Navy has a handful of, uh, of uh, small warships there. So it's really going to be up to the RCF. And we have some of our Cracker Jack frontline aircraft out there to defend the West Coast on the 8th of December, 1941. So you're going to see things like the, the Blackburn Shark make its, uh, its wartime debut and then the Stranraer as well, too. In fact, in September 1940, so a few months before the start of the war, we had roughly what they would say would be 20 serviceable frontline aircraft. And that would be two Stranraers, 14 Sharks, and four Northrop Deltas. And that was to some extent of the Pacific Coast Air Force at that time. And here are some uh, pictures from uh, Terry Higgins to give you a, a good idea. So, in the lead up to uh, the attack in Pearl Harbor, you, some of the Bolingbrooks are going to be moved out there and they're going to be our, uh, our frontline aircraft for the opening, uh, opening months of the Aleutian campaign. Interestingly enough, the, the Bolingbrook will be actually used as a fighter aircraft, which I find an interesting use of uh, that particular light bomber. These are just a couple of images and eventually it's going to be replaced by Kitty Hawk. Now, Canada is not going to see much in the way of actual wartime, um, wartime involvement with the Japanese. Of course, we're going to see the uh, shelling of the Estevan Point Lighthouse, although there's been some question about that in, the, in recent historical research and stuff. And then in 1945, we're going to see some Japanese balloon bombs. But fundamentally, most of our involvement with uh, the Japanese on the West Coast is going to be up in Alaska. So this will give you an idea of sort of the order of battle when you take a look at the period that we're looking at. So 1939, this is what you've got. And by 1943, you're going to have a significant Air Force or RCF presence on the West Coast. 
And that's not counting all of the radar sites, all of the other bases and stuff we have there. Now this goes far and above what is required for the actual defense of British Columbia. This is virtually a political requirement. One, uh, to help out with the Americans who, especially in uh, December 41 and January 42, are really crying for assistance because they're as unprepared on the West Coast or virtually unprepared on the West Coast as we are. And secondly, this is also to uh, calm the fears of West Coast Canadians uh, who feel that they are in the front line and they need protection. So this is more of a political requirement than it is actually a military requirement. But you can see by 1943, a significant presence on the, on the West Coast. And again, this is going to give you a sort of an idea of the primary focus of the West Coast, uh, Western Air Command, West Coast Home War Establishment. It's going to be looked at. And when you see Prince Rupert, Prince Rupert is uh, basically up here. That's going to be the focal point when it comes to the RCF defense plans, because that's a major staging port or will become a major staging port for U.S. forces in Alaska. So that's going to become one of the primary centers that the RCF is going to be responsible for defending. So when we send our forces up north, north of Alaska, we're going to group them together into two wings, X and Y wing. Uh, uh, as an aside, I was asked to make some suggestions because the RCF is going to stand up a space wing, a brand new wing uh, for um, for space power here in Canada, and they were looking for some names. So when I was looking back through the history and going to make some suggestions, I couldn't resist saying, hey, you could call it X-Wing, and you could use as a logo the old thing from Star Wars posters, and you could call it Canada's own X-Wing, but they didn't buy that, so it's gonna be called Seven Wing now. That's it. So again, we're going to be, we're going to be uh, focused on this. This is going to be the battleground for the ocean campaign. And the Japanese are going to make it a battleground in June of 1942. So they, their opening salvos are in the 3rd or 4th of June. They attack the port of Dutch Harbor. Uh, Dutch Harbor is not much in the way of a port, but it is one of the major American military installations in the area at the time. So the Japanese are going to stage a carrier raid on it on the 3rd and 4th. And the amount of damage they cause is inconsequential. There's a handful of individuals killed. They do some damage to the facilities, but it's really more of a nuisance raid than it is anything else. And this is part of an overall uh, larger Japanese strategy that involves an attack in Midway, uh, pushing forward into uh, that part of the Pacific and basically trying to draw the Americans into what they figure is going to be a decisive naval engagement. In addition to the attacks on Dutch Harbor, they're going to invade and occupy two uh, Aleutian Islands. First in Kiska on the 6th of June, 1942, and then they're gonna land in Attu on the 7th of June, 1942. Now, these become important not because of the islands themselves. The islands are inconsequential and I've flown over both islands and both islands are Interesting places to visit, but you sure as hell wouldn't want to live there. And if you were a soldier, you sure as hell wouldn't want to be stationed there. And all of this part of the Japanese strategy is going to become moot after the Battle of Midway, because the Battle of Midway is going to be a crushing defeat for the uh, for the Imperial Japanese Navy. They're going to rethink their strategy. There's going to be great discussion as to whether or not they're going to withdraw their forces from the Aleutian Islands, but Instead, they decide to leave them there and they're gonna look at reinforcing them to a certain extent because they figure that at the very least they will tie down some American forces that might be used elsewhere. And from an American point of view, they take on an importance that is all out of proportion to their actual territory and their actual uh, possibility of influencing the war. These will become uh, ver the only American soil, North American soil, U.S. soil that is occupied by the Japanese during the Second World War. And that makes it a political necessity that the Americans do something about it. And because it becomes a U.S. political necessity, as we've all learned over the years, it becomes a, uh, an aspect that the Canada and Canadian politicians 
have to take into account. I'm going to talk about why wing first. Why wings in Annette Island and why is it at Annette Island in Alaska? It's because we couldn't find a suitable airfield to put our aircraft in order to defend Prince Rupert. However, the Americans had an airfield that they had built at Annette Island, but they didn't have the aircraft to man it. So the two sides got together and we decided we were going to station aircraft at Annette Island at the very beginning. And the very first ones we send are we send uh, our, our beautiful Bowling Book Fighter Squadron. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with a Bowling Book Fighter, it's got a very small gun pod that fits into the bomb bay. Hard to see in this particular picture, but I found a better picture in the next slide and I'll show you. So again, they're going to be up here at Annette Island, and it's really to defend the port of Prince Rupert. And now you can see you have a better shot of what the gun pod looks at like on uh, the bowling board. Uh, to my knowledge, although I can stand to be corrected, I'm not sure if that gun pod was ever used in anger against another aircraft. It could have been in the European theater, but I don't really think it was in our theater. The first commander of Y-Wing is gonna be squadron leader Nesbitt, DFC. Uh, he's a, a veteran of the war in Europe, and he's going to be uh, uh, allowed to bring his expertise to stand up the squadron. So you're going to have the bowling books there, and eventually they're going to be joined by uh, Kitty Hawks as well, too. Now, life in Ed Island, from everything I've read, is just ducky. Hence why they're wearing duck boots and walking on duck boards. Uh, it's basically a, one of these areas that is carved out of the wilderness. The winds, I understand, are ferocious. Uh, in fact, they very quickly learned that the best place to stick uh, a tent is underground. So they dug basically pits, put the tent up in the pit, and that way they could avoid the worst of the winds and stuff like this. Uh, it's lovely, I guess, if you enjoy a muskeg and the outdoors. A uh, bit of a bugger if you got to do any work and stuff like this. So here you can see the duck boards, the sidewalk going from where the uh, airmen lived all the way over to where they the flight line and the hangars and stuff. Eventually they would get Quonset huts, the height of luxury in the Second World War. And you found rest wherever you could. If you could find a place that was dry, you'd lay down on. My understanding was that when they first got there, everyone was issued a sleeping bag and four blankets and good luck. No enemy action was was uh, forthcoming for the uh, units at, uh, at Annette Island. What they did do is have to deal with the weather, primitive conditions, and the inability to put a Kitty Hawk down on a very small runway. Uh, aircraft accidents were common, and the maintenance guys did some uh, unbelievable work in some very primitive conditions, but that was the hardest thing they were gonna have to deal with at Annette Island. Now, X-Wing is slightly different. X-Wing is actually going to be the one that deploys forward as far forward in Alaska as we're gonna go during the Aleutian campaign. It's gonna be uh, commanded in first by Squadron Leader McGregor, uh, again, a Battle of Britain veteran, and he's gonna bring his European expertise out here as well too. Now, the Aleutian campaign in itself is really a story of airfields and building airfields and getting the material to build airfields as you go around. So as you take a look at the Canadians, they're going to come up and they're going to come up through Yakutat, then to Elmendorf. The Bolingbrook squadron is going to remain at Elmendorf and then uh, deploy a little bit forward into Nome sometimes. And the fighter guys are going to go down through Kodiak, Alaska, to Fort Glenn, to Adak, to Amchitka, and then basically that's where they're going to go. But it's really about bringing in the supplies, carving out the airfields, and moving forward as close as you can. This part of the world has to have some of the most unpredictable, crappy weather I've ever seen. And the, the guys back in 1940, 42, and 43 didn't have all of the resources and stuff that we had when I last time I flew out there in 1993. So again, uh, the weather and the environment is going to be as deadly to the allies here as the enemy ever was. Eight squadron, bomber reconnaissance squadron operating the bowling book. They're gonna be flying out of Nome and, uh, and Elmendorf. 
The Bowling Brooks do good work as uh, basically maritime patrol aircraft, but the biggest issue the squadron is going to find, it's going to be getting spare parts. It's going to be the ability to get things in after they, after they do uh, occasional hard landings and find the, the equipment to, to uh, keep going. They can't go to the Americans for it because this is not an American aircraft. This is a Canadian built British designed aircraft. So they're gonna have to rely either on being able to make the parts, cannibalize their parts or get parts in from uh, Western Air Command. And that becomes very, very difficult as the war goes on. And then of course, Elmendorf itself, itself is, although it's a major airfield, is again, still pretty primitive from the perspective of operating uh, heavy aircraft and stuff like that. So they're gonna have their, uh, their work cut out for them. Now, 8th Squadron will not see any combat action, but they will fly thousands of hours, uh, basically looking for Japanese submarines in the Gulf of Alaska and further north. 111 Squadron is going to deploy Kitty Hawks, uh, P-40s, and they're gonna start off going through Kodiak, Alaska and stuff like this. So these guys were basically uh, out of Rockcliffe and then they moved west when, uh, when war was declared and then they were sent up. Now, by the time that X-Wing and Y-Wing were stood up in uh, 42, these two Canadian organizations basically accounted for one quarter of the American Air Force or Army Air Force's combat power uh, at the start of the Aleutian campaign. They have a sense, and I think uh, McGregor and the uh, RCF senior officers in Ottawa had a sense that what the Americans were really going to do was they were going to use the Canadians as backfill to allow the, the, their Air Force, the US Air Force, Army Air Forces to move forward and engage the Japanese. However, McGregor and uh, Air Commodore Stevenson and um, Air Vice Marshal Johnson all pushed very, very hard and got agreement that the uh, Canadians would be uh, allowed to take part in combat operations. And 111 is going to uh, open the show for us. Now, uh, a, uh, a very close pass over the, uh, the tarmac runways and stuff like there. So again, uh, although uh, it shows you the kind of skill this particular pilot has, it also shows you the primitive conditions of the runway. I mentioned earlier on how bad the weather is, and this is gonna to lead to probably the most tragic aspects of the Aleutian campaign from the perspective of the RCF. And that's the relocation flight that took place on the 16th of July, 1942. So these are Canadian Kitty Hawks that are on their transiting to a forward base, and they're gonna get caught up in the clag, and uh, fundamentally they're going to lose five of the, uh, of the aircraft. Four of them are going to run into a mountain, and one of them is going to lose, uh, is going to be lost at sea. So, for that particular thing, that particular mission, I think there were seven aircraft involved, and five of them, five of them uh, basically didn't make it. Now, that also gives you an example. Pilot Officer Eskel is one of the guys that survived, and uh, this is sort of his experiences. So basically the weather was so low, the weather was so bad that he basically figured that he was, uh, he was gonna prang in the water. Uh, but he managed to find a bit of, uh, bit of air space, a bit of uh, clear air, and he managed to make it back to the airfield. Now, the interesting thing about the RCF in this time period is some of the weird dichotomies that you find when you're doing some research. Uh, all of you are probably quite well aware that uh, at the start of the war, thousands of Americans came up north to join the RCF. In fact, they were encouraged to join the RCF. So you have this weird situation where you have an American in an RCF uniform going to Alaska to defend America. And in this case, it's uh, pilot officer Dean Whiteside from Waterville, Kansas. So basically, he came up, looked like a nice kid, an average student, became a pilot, was uh, posted to 111 Squadron on the 3rd of March, and then he goes off to um, Alaska as part of the Aleutian campaign. He is one of the individuals that's killed on the 16th of July. 
So then you have his mother who's trying to find information on where her son is buried, get a picture of where her son is buried, and she cannot get that from the Americans, even though he is buried in uh, a Commonwealth war grave plot at the Fort Richardson uh, Cemetery in uh, just outside of uh, Anchorage, Alaska. So basically, she has to come to the RCF to get information on her son, who's an American buried in a Canadian uniform. It's uh, one of these weird things that, uh, that happened uh, quite a bit, I'm afraid. So by now, the Canadians have been forward deployed and they're going to start combat operations. They, what they're going to do is rather than move Canadian Kitty Hawks forward, because Canadian Kitty Hawks at this time are not equipped with drop tanks. And after the 16th of July, they said, we're not flying without some extra fuel for you guys. So they're going to deploy pilots forward and they're going to use US Kitty Hawks in order to engage in combat operation. And in this particular case, they're going to be assigned to an American squadron and they're going to create a Canadian flight. So in September 1942, they're going to attack the Japanese facilities on Kiska. Now, squadron leader Broomer, which is another one of these things, if you know anything about the Aleutian campaign, you know uh, about squadron leader Broomer. He's going to engage a roof and a roof is a float equipped Japanese Zero. So in this particular day, there's 40 Kitty Hawks. The Canadians provide eight of them. They're a flying escort for some bombers that have attacked Kiska, and then they're free to engage or strafe as they see fit. So two roofs uh, come up from Kiska in order to uh, engage the attacking forces. Uh, squadron leader Broomer manages to shoot one down, and the other one is uh, shot down by an American pilot. Uh, so here we have the, his aircraft, or the aircraft they, they, uh, they say that he was flying when he shot down the roof. And there you have another one of Terry Higgins' uh, wonderful little drawings there and stuff like this. You see the rondel that they painted on the American aircraft. Now, the Americans weren't very happy when they did that because they kind of figured they'd be getting the aircraft back. And they, when they saw that the Canadians were doing this, they, weren't, they said, hey, how come? And they said, well, you know, it's Canadian. We borrowed it. And so this is a bit of a bit of description on how he shot down the roof. This was virtually the last combat operation that the Canadians would fly uh, in 1942 because then the, the Alaskan winter came and basically no more combat operations until the spring of, uh, of 1943. But they got to experience life in some of these beautiful out of the way places. Uh, again, snow, you see the, the Quonset huts, the people I always feel sorry for when I see these images are the ground crew because they just are going crazy trying to keep everything flying in the snow. Excuse me. Some of these, uh, some of the uh, living conditions were less than ideal, and it gives you a a new sense of uh, of uh, camaraderie and living with your friends and things and stuff like this with the uh, with the heaters and things. I often wondered if they worried about things like uh, carbon dioxide poisoning or anything when I see some of these uh, rather uh, unusual heaters and things, but. They had all the comforts of home. They had uh, the, the washcloths, they had uh, where you could have baths, and you had the indomitable paper aid. And I must say one thing about the paper aid, as laborious as it was, I never, ever, ever had a computer glitch when I got paid that way. It was perfect all the time. And of course, if you lived uh, near, um, near Anchorage or one of the larger American facilities, then you had the ability to be entertained with the USO and, and uh, perhaps have some of the local girls join you for a dance and stuff like this. Although as I'm looking at the gentleman, uh, I think he's a warrant officer staring at her. He seems more predator than, uh, than anything else at this point in time and stuff like this. Must be, he must have been in Alaska for a while here. And then of course, you did have all the comforts of home. Two seaters, no waiting, and 
you can tell it was built by a guy because there's reading material there. I think it's brilliant. The Americans in the spring of 43 were preparing to retake the islands that the Japanese occupied. Now, when I show you the map here, you can see that Atu is further away than Kiska is from the main American bases at Adak and Amchitka. However, they felt that the, since the garrison was smaller in Atu and that the facilities were not as uh, well developed, that this would be an easier target than attacking Kiska at this point. So these are the Japanese forces that are arranged at, at uh, Atu. You can go down them all, but basically, although the numbers vary sometimes, there's about uh, 26 to 2,800 uh, Japanese, depending on what source you have. And you can tell by the picture on the right-hand side, they're tough looking buggers, because right now they are living on uh, whatever supplies and material that can be snuck through the tightening uh, United States naval blockades around these islands and things. So about 2,800 Japanese are gonna be there. They do not have any air power. By now, all of the roofs, and you can see an overhead shot of some of the roofs here that were at Atu at one point in time, have been destroyed. So they are, they are virtually uh, helpless. So the Allies have complete total air superiority over Atu. They estimate it will take three days to take this island, and they put together 24,000 soldiers and a, uh, a fleet that uh, numbers in the uh, basically almost 100 ships. So there's roughly 40,000 Allied personnel are going to take on these 2,600 plus Japanese soldiers, Marines, and civilians. It is not a very pleasant place to fight. Uh, Atu is, uh, is uh, basically a desert, if you will, a winter desert. And the Americans come in very poorly equipped for this kind of, of weather. They, uh, they fundamentally have uh, left most of their winter gear at home. And when they find out they have uh, difficulties with supplying everything, they prioritize ammunition and bullets before they prioritize winter clothing and winter coats. So the guys are gonna go in there and it's going to be, again, another case where the weather is just as deadly as the enemy. It's going to take them three weeks to take the island. And there are some sources that say that on the, uh, towards, the end of the, towards the end of the fight, roughly 600 Japanese are left and they're gonna stage the first bonsai charge of the war. Uh, it's, a, it's a failure. Uh, it is broken with hand-to-hand -hand combat, but fundamentally, these 2,600 Japanese will tie up uh, the better part of an American division for three weeks. And this is the Butcher's Bill. This is the second most costliest fight percentage-wise after Iwo Jima. So when you take a look at this, this is one of the few battles that the Americans fought with the Japanese during the Second World War, where American casualties outnumbered the Japanese. This scared the crap out of them, because now they were going into Kiska, and Kiska was supposedly more heavily defended and uh, with more troops and more, more uh, fortifications than Atu. Now they're going to invade Cottage, or, or correction, Kiska for Operation Cottage, the 15th and 16th of August, 1943. But before they invade, based on their experiences at Atu, they're gonna bomb the crap out of Kiska. They're going to make it their mission to try to sink the island. So basically, here's a map again. Here's Kiska. Amchitka is only 50 miles, or a little more than 50 miles away from Kiska. So flying out of Adak and Amchitka, they're going to start operations. Now, the RCF is going to take part in these combat operations, uh, providing fighter escort. Uh, 111 Squadron and 14 Squadron are going to be the two RCF squadrons that are going to take place in this. But they're going to do it not by providing aircraft or even maintainers. They're going to rotate pilots through 
And these pilots are going to fly, again, American-provided aircraft. And they're going to go through and uh, support the Americans. Again, the facilities are as primitive as before. And here you can see a, a raid going off and stuff. So the Canadians are going to participate. And towards the end of it, just before Operation Cottage takes place in, in August, the Canadians are going to start to mention in their uh, reports and in their diaries and things that it looks like Kiska is abandoned. They're not getting any uh, anti-aircraft. They're not seeing any movement on the ground. But they keep pounding and pounding and pounding the target and stuff like this. Again, the Americans amass a, a massive fleet. And in this case, they're going to use the, uh, their infantry division again. They're going to have some ancillary troops. And from a Canadian perspective, they're going to use both the Special Service Force. And they're also going to provide for the first time uh, National Resource Mobilization Act troops, so-called zombies, individuals who were conscripted for service in Canada. And Mackenzie King interpreted in Canada as meaning anywhere in North America. And this is going to be the first time these guys uh, go into combat. These are the landings. The Americans land on the 15th, the Canadians land on the 16th, and they find that the Japanese have managed to sneak away. In fact, the Japanese uh, basically use this as a propaganda victory against the Americans that they managed to sneak away several thousand of the troops under the eyes of this massive uh, Allied fleet, if you will, and stuff like that. So both the U.S. and the Canadians land at what they think is a heavily defended island, and it turns out to be empty. However, that does not stop the, uh, the attacking forces from taking casualties. The 13th Infantry Brigade, 1st Special Service Force, and we go along and we lose five Canadian soldiers. So when you take a look at the casualties here, at what is fundamentally an empty, an empty uh, facility where they just left basically their supplies and stuff. The attacking force ends up with 92 dead and 221 wounded from friendly fire. Again, the weather is such that sometimes the fog and the low cloud and everything and stuff like this, you can't see in front of you. You are expecting to run into Japanese. You know that they fought so hard for Atu. You figure you're going to get the same thing in Kiska. And if you hear a noise, you open fire, and there you go. But when it comes to combat, other than squadron leader Broomer, really the biggest threat that faced the RCF during the Aleutian campaign was the weather. And uh, Flying Officer Fanning summed it up perfectly. So we actually have two squadrons that have the Aleutian battle honor, and that's 400 and 442 squadrons. That's basically a 111 fighter squadron and a 14 fighter squadron. They were renumbered, and they were sent overseas as uh, part of the contribution to the buildup to the Normandy invasion. So all of that experience they got flying in the Aleutians, some of it anyway, uh, was used uh, in, the, uh, in the Normandy battlefield. And some of them, such as Squadron Leader Boomer, would basically learn his trade in the Aleutians and then die in Europe. He was, he was killed in 1944. But these are the only two squadrons with a, uh, an Aleutian battle on. Now, in, in the Fort Richardson Post Cemetery, there are 12 Canadians, seven RCF and five Canadian Army. I already mentioned the, uh, the four that were killed flying into the mountain on the 16th of July, 1942. One of them uh, has uh, no known grave. Uh, that's uh, Flight Sergeant Baird. Uh, he's commemorated on the memorial in Ottawa. And there are three other uh, air crew that are buried here. All of them were killed in aircraft accidents flying out of Fort Glenn. So why, when I talk to the people in uniform, why do I say that the Aleutian campaign is worthy of study since for all practical purposes, it was a sideshow. Yes, it involved tens of thousands of allied soldiers, uh, you know, up to, uh, up to several hundred Canadians, especially RCF personnel, but why is that important? Well, first of all, I think it emphasizes the fact that 
even though we like to believe that Canada has never been involved in uh, a modern war and stuff like this, we actually have been. Not only is this been an aspect that we should study, we should also take a look at the Battle of St. Lawrence, which we lost. We should also take a look at the ASW campaign for Eastern Air Command. All these things mean fundamentally that the requirement to defend our country in either ourselves or in conjunction with the United States is not new and it's not something that doesn't happen. It's something that, that can and has happened if you have a determined enemy. The other reason is this is really one of the few times that the RCF has, has fought in Arctic conditions. And here, as I mentioned many times during my presentation, it's not just the enemy you got to worry about. It's the weather. It's the facilities. It's the sheer uh, cussedness of the uh, of the area you have to operate in. It's trying to get uh, supplies and personnel at the end of a of a supply chain that stretches thousands of kilometers. All of these things are things that you that any uh, good RCF planner or good RCF operator have to take into account. But we don't study the one time we had to do this. And the last one that I think is very, very important is this the first time that Canada on its own went into a major operation with the United States. And very quickly, we learned that the Americans are very appreciative of the experience and the training and what we bring, but they don't necessarily want to let you play the way you want to play. They want to do things their way. And if that means that you're going to be gate guards, well, they go off and well, you free up troops and they go off and do what they want to do, then that's what they're going to do. So you have to be prepared to, um, to push your point and to make sure that you get out of the operation what you want as a nation rather than, than just as a junior partner in a massive military undertaking. So all of those things combined, to me, make it very, very important why we should study these so-called sideshows such as the Aleutian campaign. And in 46 minutes, I thank you for your attention and stuff.